This is Ray Mosselder. Thomas Jefferson said the strongest reason for the people to retain the right to keep and bear arms is it as a last resort to protect themselves against tyranny in government. Thomas Jefferson. The picture that you see of these two men is an actual photo from the Great Depression days. And I am reading this book, March 30th, 2022, because we're facing a possible another economic crash. The Democrats are spending so much money. Joe Biden is at the head of that. And he is as our president. He spends money like water. And the Democrats love it because they know it will bankrupt America. We could be right back into a Great Depression, this time being done absolutely on purpose. Pastor John Robinson called an emergency board meeting to discuss the Randall speech. Gentlemen, I want to thank everyone for clearing your schedule on such a short notice. I prayerfully considered what Paul Randall had to say in, in his speech. I've also considered what Anthony Howe has pledged to do upon his inauguration. I tend to believe him when he says he'll put the new restrictions on firearms by executive order. I really believe we need to get out of dollars immediately and entirely. I've been on the phone this morning and negotiated several deals. They're simply pending your approval. I've negotiated what I believe to be a fair price for the farm adjacent to the Howard Young place that was gifted to Liberty Chapel recently. The deal would give us nearly 500 acres between the two farms. I've arranged two separate large bullion purchases with a local dealer and another one in Montana. I've also spoken with the CEO of Castle Arms in the Idaho Panhandle. Those folks at Castle, oh, they're really good people. They're not accepting cash, but they promised to hold 200, 200 AR-15s and 830 round magazines if we can pay them in bullion. We should be able to do that if it all goes well with the metals transaction. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask you to vote on the entirety of my recommendation. If the vote isn't unanimous, we can go back and look at what needs to be changed. The chairman recommended a vote, and it was unanimous. He made a motion to allow the, the pastor to convert all liquid funds into hard goods by any means he saw fit. That motion also passed unanimously. There was a great deal of trust that had developed between the pastor and the board over the years, and they were all in agreement that times were going to get tough in the near term. Pastor Robinson explained his plan to build barracks on the two farms and his plans to store up as much food as possible. The details would be worked out later. For now, they needed to act on the mission at hand. As they left the boardroom, Pastor Robinson put Ron White in charge of food storage. I want you to see how much bulk rice, beans, and what you can purchase from any nearby distributors. Recruit anyone you need to help drive trucks or, you know, make separate purchases. 
Robert Rust, the range master, is going to start building up the ammunition stores. Ron asked, what about Castle Arms? Don't they produce ammo? I thought those folks up in the Idaho Panhandle taught their children to reload ammo in home school. Ron was only half joking. He was sure he remembered a story of a woman from Lewiston teaching her kids to reload as part of their curriculum. They all shoot and they're all homeschooled up there, Pastor John Robinson replied. It only stands to reason that the kids probably reload, but no, Castle doesn't produce ammunition. I know a lot of folks there have a good stockpile of ammo, but no one's selling. They see copper jacketed lead as a precious metal. Albert Rust is good friends with a sales rep from Cabela's. He seems to think he may be able to get a pallet or two of 223 ammo. Do you intend to engage the government? Ron asked somberly. Pastor John replied, Well, I pray it never comes to that, Ron. But the Second Amendment is the teeth of the Constitution. It protects our right to worship. If we give that up, we'll let them tell us when we can pray to it and who as well. It's all part of the same Bill of Rights. I'll stand my ground. I don't want to die. But I'll not stand idly by while a criminal government desecrates the law of the land it makes their country into a concentration camp. Once they're loading us into the cattle cars, it'll be too late to defend ourselves. You know, I saw a documentary on the Holocaust last week, Ron said. So many of the photos show the Jews being herded into the cattle cars. Only two or three armed Nazis with guns. If they'd only known what they were in for, they could have easily overpowered the guards. Pastor John said, Well, the Nazis spent years conditioning the Jews to accept ever-increasing encroachments upon their liberty. Each temple it was just a minor inconvenience, more than what they'd been conditioned to tolerate from the time before was the proverbial frog in the boiling water approach. That sounds familiar. Pastor John continued, no one with the mind of a free man will walk willingly into a gas chamber even if you tell him it's a shower. It's a long drawn out process of training a group to think like slaves that takes away the will to fight. Once you've taken that, extermination, huh, simple. That's why we must draw a line in the sand. If we're to die anyway, let us die with dignity and honor. Any man that doesn't respect your God-given right to defend yourself doesn't respect your God-given right to live. Ron said, yeah, if we must die, let's die free. You know, you're a true patriot, Ron, Pastor said. He smiled as they walked together. Pastor John parted ways with Ron and grabbed two of the single men who were on the church grounds. They picked up a box truck from the church motor pool. You guys packing? the pastor asked. They shook their heads and said no. One of the men, Will Pender, said, I um, have my 911 in the truck. I didn't carry it when we're working because we get so dirty. Pastor John said, well, we'll swing by your truck and grab it. I have a Glock 26 that James can use. 
We're hulling the widow's might today, gentlemen. They placed a large bag of cash in the cab of the truck and headed out to purchase the bullion in Kalispell, Montana. It was going to be a long trip. I appreciate you men coming on the journey today, the pastor said. He told them they would be gone until the next day. He was trying to keep everything as hush hush as possible. Now that they were en route, there'd be less temptation to tell their friends what they were doing. Pastor John filled them in on all the details. Now, once we purchased the bullion, we are heading to Cordelin. It's about another five hours from Callis Bell. One of the folks at Castle Arms used to go to Liberty Chapel. We'll be staying at his ranch near Coeur d'Alene. The men stopped in Missoula, just past the Montana border, to eat dinner. They ate at the hitching post. James and Will snickered a bit when they went inside. It looked more like a bar than a restaurant. They both took pictures with their phones. No one would believe Pastor John was in a bar unless they had hard evidence. They all had the barbecue pork chops. Each had a cup of coffee before they left. There was still more than 100 miles to Kalispell. This was no time to get sleepy. The men finally made it to the private mint where they picked up boxes filled with silver and gold bullion. Four hours later, they were in Coeur d'Alene. James McIntosh said, I'm surprised by the amount of don't tread on me flags flying under the American flag. Seems every car and truck bumper had a sticker with a silhouette of a minute man or the Roman numeral three? Will Pender said, The Roman numeral three represented the patriots who were willing to fight. Only 3% of the population initially supported the original American Revolution of 1776. Pastor John said, There are several appeal to heaven flags flying. I remember those from my old history book. They flew in the American Revolution also. The flag was inspired by John Locke, who spoke about appealing to heaven when earthly power deny men of their God-given rights. The people who were still out in the street on this briskly cool night didn't look like, had, like they had chips on their shoulders. They don't, didn't strike the pastor as people who were readying themselves for war. Nonetheless, it was no mistaking. This community had drawn their line in the sand. Chapter 23, 7 3.17 says, The Lord your God is with you, is mighty to save you, He'll take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He'll rejoice over you with singing. Zephaniah 3.17 Matt had a fitful night. He woke several times wondering if they'd be able to sell the house in a hurry. Each time he woke up, he prayed that God would send them a buyer. He got up early, did the morning routine. Then he retrieved $3,000 from the safe, tucked his Glock in the back of his pants, and headed to Davy to check out the trailer. When he arrived, the man who met Matt fit the profile he expected. The man wore boots, straw cowboy hat, lead jeans, and a checkered shirt. People from Davie looked more like Texans 
than Floridans. It was nice. It was too bad they didn't have more influence on the rest of the county. They had voted for Al Muhammad by a two to one ratio in the previous election. Howdy, the man said as he walked off the porch toward the trailer. Are you hauling horses? No, uh, personal belongings, Matt replied. Are you taking Randall's advice? The man asked. Yeah, we're heading to Kentucky to be near family. Well, I don't blame you. Folks around here are digging in. We mostly all grew up here, you know. If Hal wants the guns from Davy, Florida, he'll have to take them bullets first. Matt smiled as he looked the trailer over. It had small rust spots, but it was in good shape. The inside was exceptionally clean. He knew he'd be in trouble if he brought home something that smelled like horse manure. Can you take $2,500 for it? Matt asked. Well, you could have it for 2000 if you want to pay me in silver or gold. But if you're paying with federal funny money, I have to have 3000 Matt looked up as he did some quick math in his head and thought about how he could convert the cash back into gold if he went home to get gold to pay the man. He decided the risk of getting stuck with the paper wasn't worth it, so he just paid the man with the cash. The man gave Matt a hand getting the trailer hitched to his truck. Thank you, fella. You'll have a, you all have a safe trip to Kentucky. I better go spend this while I still can buy something, Man said with a smile as he walked toward his own truck. Matt stopped at Home Depot to buy a few more five-gallon gas jugs. There were only two left on the shelf. He fi found five more gas cans, but they only held two gallons each. The last thing he wanted to do was to get stuck halfway between Florida and Kentucky with no gas. Besides, it would be good to have gas stored in Kentucky as backup or a barter item. Gas had jumped from $7.25 the day before Paul's speech to $8.20 today. People were starting to hoard it as they anticipated the price to spike higher. He stopped at the racetrack gas station to fill up the truck and the new gas cans. He found four more one-gallon cans inside racetrack. The truck held 26 gallons. He had 15 gallons in the shed. That plus the new plastic cans made the total 65 gallons. If you figured it would only get about 13 miles to the gallon with the trailer full, it still needed another 15 gallons to be saved. He stopped by an auto zone on the way home and found exactly three more five gallon cans. Once they were filled, he headed home. Karen came out as he was backing the trailer into the driveway. She had a look of curiosity on her face. That's the trailer? That's it, Matt replied. It's for horses. It'll hold furniture too. This was $3,000 and everything else was $10,000 or more. U-Haul has nothing and won't have anything for weeks. We don't even know if we can sell the house, Karen said. Well, we still have to leave even if we don't sell the house. They had a quiet lunch, then Matt asked Karen to go to Publix to get some boxes. Are we packing already? Shouldn't we at least wait until we get an offer on the house? 
Karen didn't do well with fast changes. Unlike Matt, she needed time to digest things. It would nearly tap us out. But we could still buy the farm with our silver and gold, even if we don't sell the house. I don't want to waste two trips to go look at it and then come back and move everything. I don't know if we have much time. People are hoarding gas. It may trigger a gas shortage. Could be weeks or months before it's resolved. If the farm doesn't work out, we'll have to stay with Adam and his family for a while. Well, why didn't you tell me that before? Well, we were kind of doing things on the fly here, Karen. I'm making up the plan as I go along. He caught his voice raising. He inhaled and exhaled deeply, then went to hug Karen. The stress of the situation was getting to both of them. Everything's going to be just fine, baby. I just need you to support my decisions right now. We have to move fast or things are going to get away from us. Karen didn't say anything, but she gently stroked Matt's earlobe with her finger as he held her. And he knew that meant okay. Karen went to get the boxes and Matt measured out the dimensions and drew it out on a piece of paper. There was a knock at the door and Matt did what he had been doing over the past weeks. He drew his gun and went out the side door to see who it was. It was Jack Mason from next door. I guess you guys are heading out. How did you guess? Matt responded with a snicker. Well, let's see. It was the for sale sign on the lawn or the trailer. Or it was both. You'd think it's going to get that bad, huh? Mad Max bad, brother. Well, we'll head up to my mom's in North Carolina if it gets too bad. Is she stocked up? No, I think we'll have a chance to stock up if we think, see things starting to slide down him. Just like you had a chance last time, Matt asked in a slightly sarcastic tone. You have a point. Don't wait till your house is on fire to stop, start shopping for fire insurance, Jack. Matt learned long ago that people would avoid looking at reality as long as possible. Normalcy, bias, causes people to believe nothing bad will happen to them because it hasn't happened to them before. I'll let you get back to what you're doing. Give me a call if you need any help packing. We'll sure miss you here. Well, we'll miss you guys too. Karen returned and Matt started loading dishes and kitchen items into the boxes she had retrieved from Publix. After that, he started loading all of the dry storage food items from the extended pantry that he built several years back to accommodate the great deals Karen regularly brought home on her couponing halls. The day was finished and they went to sleep. Matt slept much better since he burned off much of the nervous energy in completing the day's tasks. The next morning, Matt's phone rang. It was the realtor. She said, Matt, a representative from Blackstone contacted me about your house. He's offering $55,000. Now, I know this is a lot less than you wanted, but he can close in three days. If you went out fast, this is probably your only opportunity. They've been buying foreclosures for several years now. It's their business model to purchase well below market. 
Does anyone want to see it? They'll send an inspector the day after they get a contract. The buyers aren't even in Florida. They base their decision on the appraisal and the inspection report. The fund made a ton of cash in the last housing market dip. They plan to do the same thing again. I'm sure you'll get 69000 if you want to hold out for a few months. I expect things will turn back around just like they did last time. Well, good luck with that. I'm going to talk it over with my wife and call you back in an hour. Karen wasn't happy about the offer at all. She wasn't happy about listing at 69900 and she certainly wasn't happy that they would have to sell at 55000 After a 45-minute presentation from Matt on how the apocalypse, how the apocalypse was on their doorstep, she consented to the offer. Matt called the real estate back and she emailed the contract to him. Once the paperwork was done, Matt and Karen started loading a few of the furniture pieces they'd chosen to keep. Because of the limited size of the trailer, they had to be extremely selective on what they could take. Miss May the cat stayed hidden under the bed. She didn't like the commotion of moving any more than Karen did. Chapter 24 Thomas Paine said, If there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my child may have peace. Sonny arrived at the cabin with the supplies Paul Randall requested. It took Paul a moment to register that it was Sonny. He'd never seen Sonny in anything other than a formal suit or dress slacks with a button-down shirt. Sonny was wearing a ball cap, jeans, and a great t-shirt. Paul said with a laugh, Who'd you borrow those clothes from, Sonny? Well, it's my disguise for going on the lam. I thought it would be appropriate to make a minor wardrobe adjustment. Good thinking, Sonny. But I didn't intend for you to have to stay out here. You're not in trouble and you should be able to continue your day-to-day -day life. My day-to-day -day life has been trying to get you in the Oval Office, sir. Nothing has changed since you were forced underground. Besides, I don't trust Hal or Al Muhammad. We've all heard about plenty of unfortunate car accidents, disappearances, plane crashes, untimely heart attacks involving people who didn't see eye to eye with the government over the past few years. There's no need to convict me in the court of public opinion if they want me gone. Well, if you want to stay, you're more than welcome. You also know things could get nasty. Have you ever shot a gun? Nope, Sonny replied. I'm willing to learn if someone will show me. Governor Jacobs sent four guys out here for security. The twins have been talking guns with two of them. They all have suppressed weapons. Maybe they'll trade them out for our guns while we go shoot their suppressed weapons. Well, I don't quite know what that means, sir. Suppressed means they have silencers. We don't want to draw attention to this location with gunfire if we can avoid it. There isn't anybody out here, but the sound of gunshots travel a long way. Sonny took his bags into the guest room, and Paul Randall made the temporary trade with two of the guards for their suppressed weapons. 
The guards lent Paul and Sonny a suppressed HK-40 caliber pistol and a suppressed Colt M4 rifle. Hammer on by sundown, the guard joked with Paul about the M4. That's my baby. We'll take good care of her, Paul replied with a wink. The two men walked down to the lake and found a good sloping hill to shoot into. Paul set up some empty juice bottles at 5, 10, and 15 yards. He instructed Sonny with the HK pistol first. Now you want to create some tension between your hands. Keep both elbows bent and soft. Push lightly with your right hand and pull a little with your left. This will keep your aim steady as you squeeze the trigger. Slowly take up the tension on the trigger. When you're ready to take the shot, squeeze slowly. Sonny took his first shot. The suppressed pistol only made the sound of the firing pin striking the cartridge. The click of the next round being chambered and the spent round dropping to the ground. His first shot was several feet away from his target. Within minutes of continued coaching, Sonny was hitting the bottles at five yards. How's that? He asked with a smile. Well, a person's a bigger target than a juice bottle, Sonny. If you can hit that, you can hit a person. Next, they trained with a rifle for a while, then returned to the cabin. When they arrived, the twins were getting a wild boar that they took with a crossbow in the woods. Ryan called out to Sonny, Do you like roast pig? I can't say I've had the pleasure of trying it before, but yeah, I suppose we'll, we shall see. I've never seen an animal being butchered before. Makes you realize your connection to the animal that had died for you to eat. I guess it gives me a different sense of appreciation. Well, I agree. Ryan and Robert finished getting the pig and dug a pit in the ground to roast it in. They found plenty of dried mesquite wood. It was very abundant in northern Texas. Kimberly made some cheddar cheese cornbread and a pot of baked beans to serve with the pig. Everyone ate outside around the pit. The four guards, the Randalls and Sonny, all sat up late around the campfire talking about the, what the future would bring and how long they would be out here. The conversation was filled with apprehension, but it also held a sense of hope and a measure of, uh, of excitement. Chapter 25 Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. Let those in the country not enter the city. Luke 21, 21. Cameron recognized the number on Matt's phone as Adams when it rang. She handed the phone to Matt. He answered, Hey, cousin! Hi, cousin, was Adam's wife, Janice. Oh, hey, Janice. Is everything all right? Matt asked curiously. Janice replied, Everything is fine. I just wanted to talk to Karen. And I didn't have her number handy, so I called your phone. I know this must be a little tough for her. We girls are nesters. God didn't build us to go out and hunt and gather like you boys. I thought I could give her a little encouragement by inviting her to come nest with me and the girls. 
Wow, that's awesome. I think she could use some cheering up about now. This is tough for her. You take it easy on her. You hear me? Jenna said with a chuckle. Yes, ma'am. Matt replied as he handed the phone to Karen. Hi, Janice. Hey, girl. The girls are so excited about you coming here. Carissa keeps asking what day you're going to be here. Mandy has all kinds of plans for you to help her sew a dress and help us can apples from the orchard. Really? Karen asks. She loved doing country stuff with Janice and the girls. Her mind began to drift to the thoughts of Little House on the Prairie with such a pure lifestyle. When she was in the mountains with them, she never missed the city. Tell them I can't wait to be there. Mandy wants to know if Miss May will be coming. Of course she's coming. She doesn't know it yet, but she's getting a little kitty cocktail to knock her out when we get done packing the trailer. Do you have room that we can keep her in until we close on the farm? Absolutely. Everything's going to be fine. I know the transition is abrupt, but you'll be happy once you get here. While the girls chatted, Matt went up to fill Karen's car for the trip. Racetrack was closed. There were big signs that read, no gas, at each entrance and a patrol car parked in the lot. Matt headed west as he knew things would be worse as he approached the beach. Three miles up the road, he found a BP station still pumping. The advertised price was $12.40 a gallon, and the line was 14 cars long. Two men were fighting in the street because one of them had evidently cut the other man off in the line. How had this happened overnight? Was this local or all over the country. Matt shook his head and turned around to go back home. He walked in and told Karen what was happening. They turned on the news for a while, which confirmed the shortages were showing up in cities all over America. The CNC reporter was saying, it seems OPEC decided to quit settling oil trade in dollars. The decision came after an emergency meeting of OPEC in the middle of the night. The perceived U.S. political tension and instability in the United States dollar, combined with the rapid increase in oil priced in U.S. dollars, caused the oil cartel to gold settlement. The decision was announced as a temporary measure that would be instituted until a different currency could be established for settlement. The BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa recently developed the BRIC. It's a monetary unit that derives its value from a basket of the member nation's currencies. The BRIC is regularly traded on the currency exchanges and has risen heavily against the United States dollar and the Euro. Unlike the Euro, the BRIC is only used for international trade settlement. The member nations still use their respective currencies with their, within their own borders. The BRICS nations are recommending that the BRIC be used to settle oil, but OPEC determined gold will be the settlement terms for the time being. Oil jumped $90 in early morning trading. 
The current price is $331 a barrel. The shock is rippling through to the pumps in real time. The oil crisis is being exaggerated by corporate hoarding. We're getting reports that gasoline producers are slowing the release of fuel to retailers because of the anticipated increase in prices. Retailers are doing the same thing. We've heard reports claiming that large trucking companies are offering to pay more than the retail pump price to ensure they have fuel to continue business. According to our source, the truck, uh, truck companies will in turn double their freight charges. Grocers are already marking up prices to cover the increase in freight. A new run on grocery stores may begin before they fully recover from the riots. Due to the announcement by OPEC, gold also jumped in the morning trade, and in the previous trading session, gold closed at $6,305 an ounce. The current price is $7,138. The $833 increase in a matter of hours is a record in both dollar terms and percentage terms for a one-day jump. And the trading day still has several hours to go. So far, the big winner of the day is silver. As increasing gold prices continue to squeeze smaller investors out of the market. Investors are pouring into silver. Silver jumped to $241 an ounce. The day's jump has closed the gold to silver price ratio from 35 to 1 to under 30 to 1. Matt decided to take the car to the used car dealership and sell it. Karen followed him in the truck to give him a ride home after the sale. The lot offered him $1,500 cash. The car was worth $6,500 in the Kelly Blue Book, but Matt took it. Today, they had to cut their losses and bug out. When they returned home from selling the car, they had to make a few cuts. There wasn't room for all of the things in the trailer and the items they intended to take in the car. They pulled out a dresser, the futon, and a box of extra dishes that they decided they didn't need. Matt repositioned the trailer so the food gun safe and gasoline were the most accessible. They intended to let Miss May sleep in the back seat of Karen's car, but now she'd have to stay on Karen's lap or the floorboard by Karen's feet for most of the trip. Since Blaine was an attorney, Matt granted him power of attorney and paid him to go to the closing for them on the following day. Blaine briefed Matt on the process before they left. The money should be wired into your account the day of closing. If all goes according to plan, the funds will clear in time to close on your farm in three days. They would only net about $50,000 after brokerage fees taxes and closing costs. But they could easily cover the difference for the price of the farm in silver or gold, especially now after the recent rise in the metal prices. Matt and Karen said their goodbyes to the neighbors and loaded up. Matt put his Ruger LC9 in an ankle holster and put his Glock 21 in the back of his jeans. 
He wore an oversized plaid shirt over his t-shirt to help conceal the large frame pistol. Matt instructed Karen to keep her Keltec in her pocket and her Glock 19 in her purse. Matt put the pistol grip on the Mossberg pump action shotgun so it would easily fit behind the seat of his pickup truck. The AR-15 would stay in the safe at the back of the trailer for now. He drilled holes in the trailer so the safe could be bolted to the trailer floor during the trip. The delays set them back. They planned to get on the road by 10 a.m., but it was after 3, and Karen picked up Miss May, who is now feeling the full effects of her kitty tranquilizer, which Karen had given her three hours prior. She only gave her a small piece with her food so she wouldn't totally stay asleep. May's eyes were glassy, and she had no problem sitting still in Karen's lap. As they pulled onto the ramp for I-95 North, Matt said, we should have prayed before we left. If we've ever needed God, it's on this trip. Karen replied, is it too late? God couldn't hear us in the truck. Matt smiled. He got the point. God, we ask that you would surround us with your favor as with a shield. Watch over and protect us on this journey. You're always so good to us, and you always protect us. We're so grateful. Thank you. I-75 was usually much busier at this time of day. Even on weekends, all the lanes were mostly full until you hit the toll booth past the Indian Casino. Matt decided to take I-95 instead of the Florida Turnpike or I-75. Would have taken them through Tampa. The Turnpike would take them through Orlando. If he continued through on I-95, it would take him to Jacksonville, which was probably the worst of the three cities, but Matt intended to get off I-95 at St. Augustine and take the back roads to connect to I-75 north of Tampa. Additionally, Matt's friend Frank lived in St. Augustine. And if they got into trouble, Frank's house was a place of refuge. The plan was good, but this route still took them through Atlanta. Atlanta had never completely returned to what would properly be described as civilized after the snap riots. The conundrum was that gas was becoming scarce and they had just enough in the reserve cans to get them to Kentucky. I-285 was a bypass that took them around the city of Atlanta, but it was still too close for comfort. In, in Matt's opinion, after they drove a little over 200 After they drove a little over 250 miles, Matt said, get the map and look and see if you can find a campground near the highway south of Atlanta. There's a magnifying glass in the glove compartment. Matt's eyesight had really deteriorated in the past few years. So he needed a magnifying glass to read the Northern Star Road Atlas. The atlas was very complete, but the icons were extremely small. Karen said, the magnifying glass makes it much easier to pick out the tent icon 
that signifies the campground. How far of south of Atlanta? She asked as she thumbed through the atlas in search of Georgia. Well, preferably about halfway between Macon and Atlanta. The less populated, the better. Here's a state park where the campground is called High Falls, Karen said. How far from Atlanta is it? Karen focused on the map. It looks like it's about 55 miles from downtown Atlanta. About 30 miles from the I-285 bypass that you said you wanted to take. How many miles is the park from I-75 exit? I'd say about two miles. Are we going to sleep in the tent? Well, I think we have to. Someone has to stand guard over the truck while the other sleeps. Things are going to get a lot worse than during this snap riots, and we're in a very vulnerable position by being on the road. The more we can stay away from people, the better off we'll be. Matt and Karen noticed less and less traffic as the day went on. Most of the traffic they saw were other trucks pulling trailers. Looks like everybody's bugging out, Karen said. Yeah, it does seem to be the pastime of the day. I'm going to pull over at the next rest stop so we can go to the bathroom and I'll fill up the gas from the cans in the trailer. The tank is almost empty. Even if the gas stations are pumping, they might be hot zones for civil unrest. Matt pulled into the rest stop parking lot. Just like the highway, it was a ghost town. There was only one other truck in the entire lot. Matt kept an eye on Karen from the truck while she went to the restroom, and she did the same while he went. They had a few pieces of cheese and crackers from the cooler. Karen got back into the truck and Matt went to fill up the truck. He started with one gallon containers because of the way he had to stack them to save space in the trailer. While he was filling that truck, two guys from the other truck in the lot came over. Howdy! How you doing? Not good. We ran out of gas. Do you have five gallons you can spare? I can't do it. I calculated exactly what I need to get where I'm going. Matt hated not being able to help. But there was nothing extra. He needed everything he had. The two guys seemed like good old boys. They both had on chain boots, and ball caps. One of the caps had some tractor brand on it, and the other was a camo print. The second man replied, How about we just take it all then? He lifted his shirt to reveal a semi-automatic pistol handle. Adrenaline rushed into Matt's brain. He dropped the gas can drew his glock and shot the man in his chest. The other man was clearly surprised. He fumbled to draw a weapon. Matt breathed out heavily, inhaled again, and then slowly exhaled as he lined up the sights with the man's head. The man drew out a nickel-plated revolver, and Matt squeezed the trigger of the Glock 21. The close range impact of the 45 caliber hollow point bullet left a small hole in the front of the man's head while the back busted open like a rotten melon. The man dropped backwards and lay beside his fallen comrade. The first man rolled over and leveled the semi auto pistol at Matt. Matt squeezed off two more rounds 
into the man's chest. The man dropped the gun. Matt walked up to the body and put two more rounds into his head. Matt grabbed both of the men's guns and threw them into the back of the trailer next to the gas cans. The revolver was a Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum. The semi-automatic was a Beretta 9mm. Matt slammed the trailer door shut and headed toward the truck. Meanwhile, inside the truck, Karen heard the shots and screamed. Even her kitty drugged out stupor. Miss May jumped out of Karen's lap and ran under Karen's seat. Karen drew her Caltech because it was in her pocket and easy to access. She checked the mirrors to see where the shots come from. She saw Matt standing next to the two bodies. Thank you, Jesus. He's okay. She said with tears already starting to flow. Matt looked at the two men. The gray matter of their brains lay in chunks spread around in thick puddles of blood. As Matt got to the door of his truck, his stomach flipped and the contents emptied on the ground. He took 10 seconds to catch his breath and calm down. Then he walked back to the trailer door to get a bottle of water and a ginger ale. He rinsed the vomit out of his mouth with the water and returned to the truck. Karen was pulling her phone from her purse. Who are you calling? 911, she replied. She couldn't believe he even had to ask. No, Matt shouted. He was thinking on an entirely different level. Of course she'd be calling 911. He should have known that, but he knew this was not the situation for that. Why? Well, there are multiple reasons I'll explain in a minute. For now, we gotta get out of here. Matt jumped back into the truck and sped off. He was careful not to go over the speed limit once on the highway. As soon as they were back on the road, he called Frank. Hey, buddy. Hey, man, I just had an incident. Whoop, wrong voices. Hey, buddy. Hey, man, I just had an incident with a couple of guys at the rest stop. I didn't get to, I need to get off the road for a while. I'm just past the rest stop north of Palm Coast. Frank could hear the panic in Matt's voice. All right, calm down. You're just one exit before mine. Get off at State Road 206 and take it west to State Road 305. Follow it north to 207. Take a real hard lift. A few yards from there, you'll be on my road. You'll know where you are once you get there. Just focus on driving for now. We'll talk when you get here. Got it. Why didn't we call the police? Number one, we don't know if there were more attackers in the area. We had to get out of there. Number two, there's no way we want to get caught up in an investigation when the world is falling apart. Those guys couldn't have been best friends with the town sheriff, but he might be one of them or both, for all we know. They could be total thugs, or they may have been robbing me out of desperation. At any rate, it may have been the town they were from, and we could end up getting lynched. Why are you going to Frank's? I need to get off the road, check the scanners, see if anyone called anything in. 
I also need to take a breather. I'm a little freaked out right now. I'm freaked out too. I guess it didn't occur to me that you'd be shaken up. You just shot two people. You wouldn't be normal if you weren't. I also threw their guns in the truck. I need to get rid of those. Why did you do that? I don't know, because I'm freaked out, I guess. I also have blood all over my shoes. I need to clean them off. Matt started to feel a knot in his throat, but there was no time for getting emotional now. He pushed it back down and kept driving. They were at Frank's house in about 20 minutes. He was in a semi-rural area. Lots of people get livestock and the houses were spread out. Frank greeted them and ushered them inside. Frank's wife, Angela, made hamburgers on the grill while Matt explained what happened at the rest stop. Karen put Miss May in her cat carrier and brought her inside. The late November air was significantly cooler in North Florida than where they came from. You can let the cat walk around if you'd like, Angela told Karen. She'd probably find somewhere to hide and we would be looking for her when it's time to go, but thank you. Frank threw Matt's hiking boots into the washing machine. His jeans had blood spattered around the bottom. Matt changed his jeans and threw them in the wash as well. Matt walked Frank over to the trailer, told him about the guns. I have no idea why I threw them in the trailer. Brother, you were traumatized. You did good. You stayed alive and you kept your wife safe. That's what you were supposed to do. Don't beat yourself up over some small detail like that. If you want to get rid of them, I'd be happy to take them and bury them. I'll always know where they are. You know, they might come in handy someday. You never know. Matt gave them to Frank, who then wrapped them in thick construction garbage bags with a sock full of rice to absorb the moisture. He then placed them in a two-gallon plastic bucket. He wrapped the bucket in more plastic, then dug a quick hole behind his tool shed. You look like you've done this before. Matt was relieved to have gotten rid of the pistols. Well, you know me, brother. I've been prepping since before it was cool. I have stuff buried all over the place. You're a regular pirate. The guys rejoined the women inside and ate the wonderful burgers Angela had made. Afterwards, they went to the computer to listen to the local police scanner on Broadcastify.com. There were several reports of looting and robberies, but they heard nothing in reference to the shooting. It's just after 9 p.m. Sounds like the natives are starting to get restless over in town. That's how it was during the riots. I see the police are going to have their hands full. They won't have time to worry about you. You all are welcome to lay low here, as long as you like, though. Well, thanks for the offer. I think I'll try to get back on the road around 1.30 in the morning. That'll put us in Atlanta at 7.30, just after sunrise. That tends to be the most peaceful time of the day. Linda will probably be a mess. We don't have enough fuel to get around it. The bypass should be okay early tomorrow morning, but I have to get through there. 
Frank replied, Sounds like you have this thought out. Well, I had it planned out before I almost got robbed. You're still on track, brother. It's just a slight detour. Do you want to try to take a nap before you go? No way. Ha! <laughs> I could never go to sleep now. Not after that incident. Well, we'll make you a big pot of extra strong coffee before you pull out. You'll be pretty far from any major cities till you get to Atlanta. Valdosta is the only big town between here and there. Driving and I will probably work out good. Make sure you top off your tank before you head out. Matt thanked Frank for his hospitality and for helping him out of this tough situation. They moved back and forth between the news radio and the police scanner and nothing was ever mentioned about the bodies. They talked about the uncertainty of the future, what the world would look like tomorrow. Times, they were a change in. That's it. For this time, chapter 26 is next. I love the book. How about you? I'll be back with it tomorrow because I'm going to read this series straight through. I'll give you Thomas Jefferson's statement now. I predict future happiness for Americans if they can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of taking care of them. Hmm. Well, that's the word for today.